Hello, everyone. This is Siddharth Amber from Chicago Arthritis and Regenerative Medicine. Welcome to our webinar today, Regenerative Medicine, Treatments for Arthritis, Tendinitis, and Back Pain. Please, if you're currently online, please indicate whether or not you can hear me and see the screen clearly. As we get started, I encourage you to send in any questions that you have on the topics that we're discussing today. I go through a lot of frequently asked questions, but it's always helpful if I can get, um, you know, answer, answer any of your specific questions as well. Okay, good. So hopefully everyone can hear me clearly right now. So as I start, um, maybe type in the chat, you know, where, where you're um, logging in from. Um, what part of the country or the world. And, um, you know, today's talk, we're going to be covering a number of things about regenerative medicine for musculoskeletal care. So from today's webinar, what you should expect is that you'll learn about the best available non-surgical treatments for arthritis, tendinitis, injuries, and back pain that do not require surgery. So that includes utilizing your own blood platelets, as well as your own body stem cells. What is legitimate, what's not legitimate in the field of medicine, and how to choose the best physicians and clinics for regenerative medicine, and really how to avoid people who are not quite as experienced in this. Great, I see we've got people really from all over the country, in particular the Midwest, Chicago metropolitan area, but other parts of the country as well, Colorado, fantastic. So the big question is, what would you do if your pain was controlled? How would your life improve? What exercises would you restart? And what activities with family and friends would you participate in? So who am I? Again, my name is Siddharth Dambar, physician here at Chicago Arthritis and Regenerative Medicine. I've been a specialist in rheumatology since uh, in practice since 2008. I also specialize in image-guided musculoskeletal injections. I've been involved in regenerative medicine since 2008, and I've been in the Regenix Network since 2012. The Regenix Network is the largest affiliation of physicians that are involved in regenerative medicine in the world, where we share results, processes, standard operating procedures, and really doing things to the best possible way that we can. So my journey into regenerative medicine. So I used to play tennis when I was a teenager competitively. I stopped playing for about 15 years as an adult. I picked it up again in my mid thirties at which I'm at a little bit of shoulder pain. Around that same time, I was starting to learn how to do musculoskeletal ultrasound. And um, I started to pay a lot more attention to not only my own kind of tendon and ligament injuries, but also to our patients as well. And it started to occur to me that we really don't have very good treatment options uh, for um, these kinds of injuries. Um, and that the, that the standard of care that's typically used is really not adequate. So traditional care for Arthritis, joint pains, tendonitis, tendon tears, strains and sprains, back and neck pains is very inadequate. It's very much about masking the pain, whether that's through injections that are really just about pain relief rather than actually optimizing or treating your condition or pain medications. And really the goal is very much just to mask the pain and eventually waiting for surgery. That's a really terrible model of care because it has a lot of side effects. Pain medications, whether you're talking about narcotic pain medications or anti-inflammatory medications, do not fix the problem. In fact, they have side effects, including anti-inflammatory medications of kidney, stomach, liver, heart, bleeding issues, cardiovascular issues. And narcotics obviously have a lot of long-term side effects in terms of dependence, dependency. The traditional injections that are utilized, that includes steroid injections, are not ideal because 
if given too often, they can actually damage the tissue that you're treating. They can lead to increased risk of infection, diabetes, osteoporosis. The other kind of common treatments that are done by interventional pain management include nerve blocks and radiofrequency ablation, where they actually try to um, stun or kind of destroy the nerve that is sensing pain. The problem is that you're damaging the nerve and you need that nerve for other things as well. And so it can lead to muscle weakness as well. So there, there's a lot of issues with the traditional treatments that really, you know, they're, they're not good enough. And um, I think a really great example is that our veterinarian colleagues who treat horses, they are really, you know, the people that own horses really are only willing to give their animals the best treatment possible. They don't rely on, on these kind of traditional treatments. They don't rely on um, chronic pain medications. They don't rely on steroid injections, nerve blocks. They end up actually using regenerative medicine treatments because that's what's actually ideal and best for the body in the situation. Problems with other traditional treatments, surgery in the appropriate situation is appropriate. You've got a broken bone, your rotator cuff tendon is fully blown out, but the vast majority of surgeries that are done are done for really conditions that could be treated with regenerative medicine. And the issue with surgery is that there are higher risks, including bleeding, infection, tissue damage. In addition, there's anesthetic risks when it comes to general anesthesia, cardiac risks. These procedures, if they're done for the wrong indication, for example, if you've got knee arthritis and you have arthroscopy, that's been proven to be no better than just physical therapy. And it can actually accelerate the arthritis process. It can increase instability. And so there are routine surgeries that are done in this country still that are not really proven to be better than just sham surgery or placebo. And for those of us that are really um, deeply involved in regenerative medicine, we feel like 80% of the things that are being treated with surgery will eventually be treated with regenerative medicine. In the same way that in the past, uh, the majority of cardiac conditions, heart disease was treated with open heart surgery. Now, many of them are treated with just either medications, uh, sometimes dietary interventions, and just needle-based procedures by cardiologists. So avoiding bigger surgeries, eventually we think that um, orthopedics will head in that same direction as well. And that's really because of regenerative medicine. So in searching for better options for myself, for family and friends, and for patients, you know, the things I've been thoughtful about are how do you avoid side effects? So treatments that are lower risk. How do you actually improve the actual cause of the problem, optimize the tissue that's involved and give you a better longer term improvement? So imagine reducing your pain and getting back to the activities you care about without surgery or pain medications. So regenerative medicine, it's essentially using your body's own cells to treat arthritis, tendinitis, injuries, and back pain. And again, really, I'm just focused on talking about musculoskeletal care, not about any other kind of organ issues. And in reality, right now in the United States, the only things that regenerative medicine can be utilized for are your joints and tendons and back. So the normal healing process, let's say you have a small cut in your finger. You have that injury. You have platelets that enter the area. Your platelets release growth factors. They stimulate your other local mesenchymal stem cells in that area. That leads to inflammation, which then leads to a proliferation of cells that come into that area, and then eventually remodeling of that tissue to relay and heal that injury. So that's a very good and reliable kind of process of, of uh, recovering from an injury. And it works very well if you have good blood flow to a tissue. The problem is that if your tissue has poor blood supply, it doesn't, heal, it doesn't heal well because you're not able to utilize those same cells in the right way. And that includes tendons, cartilage, ligaments, discs, labrum, and meniscus. So regenerative medicine is taking those same cells, platelets, and bone marrow drive cells, and injecting those cells into that tissue that's been damaged, utilizing ultrasound and x-ray guidance to really be very precise in where you're placing those cells to then get that normal healing process to occur. So what's great about that is you're utilizing the body's normal process, not something that is either artificial or foreign to the body. And you are treating the source of the problem much safer than surgery because it's not a big open procedure. You're not damaging 
all sorts of nerves and, and other tissue. It is effective for most musculoskeletal conditions, really only except for the most severe conditions. <clears throat> would this be, uh, can this still be appropriate? And again, for those of us involved in this, we feel like 80% of orthopedic surgery can be handled by regenerative medicine. So again, how does regenerative medicine work? You're optimizing damaged cellular health of tissue, right? You're getting cells in tendons and joints that are not working well to start working much better, to start functioning and being optimally at their best state. Part of that is you can replace the cells that have been damaged. Part of that is you can get the cells that have already been damaged to start pushing out the right proteins and enzymes that you see in a healthy joint or tendon. So what you end up having are what you end up having is a area that is now optimized and working closer to a healthy state. In addition, we're able to help strengthen and stabilize the support of ligaments and tendons and other soft tissues that are that are in that area. And I'll show you how we're able to do that. But by strengthening the other supportive elements around the damaged area, you can then actually help with pain and also help with function as well. Anything that helps to create a more stable functional unit will help with overall pain and function long term. In addition, chronic inflammation is a key part of what drives a lot of pain. We're able to reduce that chronic inflammation by just improving the overall health of the joint. And also you're able to help improve neuromuscular issues, nerves and muscles that are an integral part of your musculoskeletal system as well as pain. We're able to improve that by reducing the irritation on nerves, by strengthening muscles as well. And again, by overall improving the overall health of that tissue. So great question. Somebody asked, we'll be able to see a recording of this later on. Yes, absolutely. We'll post this up on our social sites later on um, so that you'll be able to watch this. And if you have family or friends or colleagues that wanted to watch this, they'll be able to watch this as well. So really basic questions. Is this legal? That's, that's a great first line question that you should be asking. The answer is yes, but understand that there are very strict guidelines from the FDA. So the three key things when it comes to guidelines are number one, are you using your own cells or somebody else's cells? If you're using your own cells, that's legal and safe. Number two, the cells cannot be significantly altered or adjusted. So what that means is as cells are taken out, they have to be utilized the same day. In addition, there's certain things that you're not allowed to do based on FDA guidance. If your physician is utilizing fat-based stem cells, there's an enzyme in there that the FDA considers to be unsafe for humans, so you can't do that. You can use fat for supportive tissue or so for, for supportive purposes uh, in the procedures, but you're not allowed to use that enzyme to create fat stem cells. And then lastly, you need to be injecting into damaged orthopedic tissue. That is considered homologous use, meaning you're utilizing the cells in a way that is appropriate for the body. You're not injecting it into other tissues that are not normally being exposed to bone marrow cells. So another really great question that's asked is, if I'm older, shouldn't I be using someone else's cells? Absolutely not. For the vast majority of orthopedic conditions, there's good evidence that using your own living cells is effective. Your body is finely attuned to utilizing your own cells. You use your own cells, you're able to get the right kind of outcome. If you use somebody else's cells, there's other risks, including that your body may reject those other cells. Your body um, detects other foreign tissue and will actually attack it. And that's something called graft versus host disease. Next, is there an age limit? For the vast majority of conditions that we treat, knees, lower back, shoulders, elbows, ankles, neck are not impacted by age. Hip outcomes are impacted by age, meaning if you're over the age of 60, the chance of getting a good outcome for hips is harder. So you'd wanna, you'd wanna be aware of that. What sort of doctor does these treatments? You know, the thing about medicine is that there's too much to know. And if you're not finally focused on one field, you're not going to be an expert in it. So my, my recommendation is if you're looking for someone to do these treatments, number one, find a physician who's focused on musculoskeletal conditions. Meaning if your physician is doing primary care on the side, if they're doing you know, aesthetics, you know, kind of Botox on the side, uh, if they're an emergency doctor on the side, they're not an expert in musculoskeletal conditions. If your attention is spread out over many other things, you're not focused on just that one thing. 
Number two, in that same vein, they should be focused on, on non-surgical treatments for orthopedic conditions. The issue for a lot of orthopedic surgeons that are trying to get involved in these procedures or, or these kind of um, treatments is that they're not focused on non-surgical treatments. Their training is in surgery. And there's a big difference between someone who's doing surgery versus someone who's doing uh, needle-based procedures where it's really finely based on ultrasound and x-ray guidance. They generally do not have those kind of skills or training, and they're generally doing these treatments uh, blindly, meaning without ultrasound or x-ray guidance, which is not the right way to do this. In the same way that cardiologists are the ones who specialize in doing angiograms and angioplasties, and cardiac surgeons stick to doing big open surgeries, you have a separation in there based on their training and based on their focus. And then lastly, I'll talk a little bit more about what makes a proper regenerative medicine expert in terms of the right approach to doing these kind of treatments. Can these treatments help if I've already had surgery? Yes, we frequently see people that have had a prior lower back surgery or uh, prior knee arthroscopy or prior rotator cuff repair, and now their issue has recurred. We see that commonly. The one exception would be if you've had the joint already replaced, in which case you no longer have a joint that we can actually work on. If your pain is coming from another part of the area, let's say you have knee pain, you've had knee replaced, but you still have knee, knee pain, then if your pain is actually coming from the lower back, then we can obviously treat the lower back. My general rules for my patients when it comes to orthopedic surgeries is number one, always see if you can keep your own anatomy, meaning a regenerative medicine treatment. Number two, avoid surgeries that are only cutting out tissue and not actually trying to repair something. That's what most arthros um, arthroscopic surgeries are. They're normally just cutting out tissue, not actually repairing something. And then always consider a regenerative medicine treatment option if you've been recommended surgery. So some of the key regenerative medicine concepts that I'll talk about that really make a regenerative medicine expert, stability. Stability is incredibly key when it comes to the body. So there's this concept in architecture called tensegrity. Tensegrity means that you take, a, you take a functional unit, there's a lot of individual parts to it. Those individual parts are very weak on their own. When you put those individual parts in close approximation and compress together, you have a much more stable overall unit than the individual units. So in the body or in biology, that's called biotensegrity. So the idea here is that if you are trying to treat an area that's been chronically damaged, by injecting your own cells into not only the joint that's been damaged, but all the other soft tissue areas that support it around that joint, you get a much stronger response and you end up getting a much better response as well, longer term. So this concept basically applies to in, in what we're doing is because we want to treat all the layers of, of tissue that, that have been damaged over time. And what that'll do is give you a progressively stronger functional unit over time, which will then give you better result and longer lasting results as well. So this is a case study to explain that someone had a lower back issue. He'd had prior lumbar laminectomy, surgery times two. The areas that we treated were not just his epidural space where he's got a pinched nerve, but we ended up treating all the ligaments, the facet joints, the muscles, and the epidural space. We originally gave him platelet-rich plasma treatment. He had an initial response of about 30%. We then escalated to using his own bone marrow drive cells, which then increases improvement to 75%. What's nice about this kind of example is number one, we really have to treat the entire functional unit. Number two, that by escalating treatment to a stronger cell, you can actually get progressive improvement. So orthobiologics basically are the cells that we use to inject into tissue. Uh, and that, again, that normally means using your own platelets or bone marrow cells. I'll give you some other examples as well. Again, utilizing your body's normal healing process, using your own cells to get that kind of repair. So platelets are that first line treatment that we're utilizing. So again, platelets help because when you inject platelets into an area, the growth factors in the platelets stimulate your own cells in that area, your own mo local mesenchymal stem cells to start that healing process. You do that by inflammation. And you do that by the growth factors from those platelets. So there's a few different types of platelet content, um, platelet types that we use. So the picture on your right shows two different types of platelet preps. Most physicians who are utilizing platelet-rich plasma will get you a platelet product that you see on the right that's very red colored. 
the problem with that is it has a very high concentration of red blood cells, which is more pro-inflammatory, which is not good for most tissue. Good for muscles, but not good for other tissue. The other cell that you see on the left, that is platelet-rich plasma where, where we've removed the red blood cells. And now what we have is only a high concentration of your own platelets and plasma. That's much healthier and better for your joints or your tendons. If your physician doesn't have that ability to sort that out by altering what kind of uh, cells that you're getting or what kind of product you're getting, you're basically getting a one size fits all product. That's not a good thing. You want something that's very highly configured for your issue. The other part to this is that if you have a joint issue, your physician should be able to concentrate that, those cells into a much higher concentration. So number one, your physician should know what concentration of platelets are creating. If they're not sure, then that's a problem. Number two, um, they should be able to tell you exactly what concentration. So when we're injecting joints, we're generally using 14 to 20 times concentration. If we're injecting tendons, we're generally using anywhere from five to 10 times concentration. If your physician does not have that ability to make that kind of adjustment, then again, you're getting a cookie cutter sort of process, which is not a good thing for you. So this is a case study of utilizing platelet-rich plasma it's a 45-year-old man. He's a cyclist. He was referred to me by a sports medicine physician. He has patellar tendonitis. The picture on the right is an example of his patellar tendonitis that's, on, that's under ultrasound. And he basically had persistent pain despite physical therapy and pain medications. So what we ended up doing in his case was a platelet-rich plasma treatment. And what we did was inject that into his, into his patellar tendon. So this is the kneecap that I've just marked. That's the patellar tendon, that's the needle. We're injecting his own platelets directly into all the areas of damage that you see that patellar tendon. So he had two treatments and he had a great response and was able to get back to a high level activity. Three years later, he presented again with his other knee now, he has a hamstring tendonitis. And again, we did platelet-rich plasma again and he had a great response and back to activity. It's a great example of where somebody who has uh, repeat treatment and is able to get back to a high level of activity. Okay, so great question here. Can this treatment be used for people who have chronic low platelets, chronic, thr chronic thrombocytopenia? Great question. Depends on the level. If you have a life-threatening level of platelets, let's say 10, and your physician needs to put you on really aggressive immunosuppressant medication to basically prevent you from dying from that low level of platelets, I would not recommend getting platelet-rich plasma treatment at that moment. On the other hand, if your platelets are chronically 80,000, 100,000, 120,000, then that's your baseline. That's what your body's used to. We can still concentrate that level of platelets to a higher level to still get you a good result. So it depends on where you are in that stage, based on how you um, ask the question that you have chronic thrombocytopenia, the answer is yes. The next type of orthobiologic treatment to be aware of are your own stem cells. That is the main uh, cell that drives tissue repair after an injury. So number one, always use your own cells. That's what your body is attuned to. That's what's safe. That's what's legal in the United States. In the United States, using your own bone marrow cells that has a high concentration of stem cells, is legal if you're injecting it into orthopedic tissue. Fat stem cells, not legal, all right? Again, that's because of the enzyme that you have to use to break apart the fat, to use that for stem cells. That is considered illegal in the United States, so your physician should not be doing that. On the other hand, if your physicians are using fat or adipose for structural support, that, that, that's still legal. So as an example, I had a patient recently, rotator cuff injury, we took a sample of his own bone marrow to create a high concentration of stem cells to inject that into rotator cuff tear. We also took a small sample of his own adipose just for um, uh, structural support, just to add more structure into that rotator cuff to mix in with his bone marrow cells as well. So that is legal, depends on how you're using it. So that, that is appropriate. So you've probably heard of amniotic or umbilical cord cells as well. You may see a lot of advertising for that, a little bit less so now, and that's because the FDA uh, and the Federal Trade Commission have come out to start uh, prosecuting clinics that are utilizing this and calling these live stem cells. The key is that there's no living stem cells in that. 
So what you have are products that after birth, tissue that's then saved, that's taken to a lab, that lab then processes it. And it processes it by basically pulverizing it, gamma radiating it, putting it into a powdered form, then put into a glass vial and then shipping it off to a physician's office. That can then sit on their shelves for 24 months, two years, at which time when the physician wants to use it, they then inject some saline or water into it to rehydrate it, mix it up, and then re-inject it. Uh, there are no living cells at that point. The cells have been destroyed. That's why you can even utilize it. If there's living cells, the FDA would not allow it. Multiple organizations have looked to see, are there any living cells? There's no living cells. So if clinics are talking about utilizing somebody else's cells in that manner, that is better for you. The reality is that there's no living cells. That clinic may not be aware that there's no living cells, or they may be giving you a false sense of what they're treating. IV stem cells, there's no proven benefit for orthopedic conditions, not legal in the United States. You may hear about using this in other countries, but there's very little data to support that usage. So stem cell treatment outcomes, we can definitely improve pain and function even in advanced cases. Why? Because we can improve stability, we can improve inflammation, we can get cells that have been chronically not working well to start working better. What that leads to is less pain and a stronger functional unit that lets you exercise more, function at a higher level, which in turn, if you're exercising more, will give you better strength of the area, which will then give you better uh, pain relief and function long-term as well. Can we improve x-ray and MRI images? If you have advanced arthritis, no. If you have physicians or clinics that are telling you that you have advanced knee arthritis and you can get that to improve base with treatment, that is not accurate. You can still get pain relief and functional improvement, depending on the joint, including with shoulders and knees and backs. You cannot get that with hips, but you can get that with knees. If you have a tendon tear, absolutely. I'll show you some examples of that. If the tendon is mildly torn, yes, absolutely. We can get the MRI images to look better. If you have a ligament tear, I'll show you an image of that for an ACL tear. Yes, you can do that as well. If you have bone swelling and arthritic joints, we can do that or if you have a condition called avascular necrosis, at an early stage, we can do that as well. We can improve the imaging. Can we treat bone-on-bone -bone arthritis? <clears throat> Simple answer is yes. Understand that arthritis is really a biologic condition. Physicians, unfortunately, use this term bone-on-bone -bone arthritis inappropriately. If your range of motion is still intact, let's say in the knee, and you've been told that you have bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, it doesn't make sense. If you have really bone on bone, you wouldn't be able to swing your knee through that full range of motion. So understand that if you have intact range of motion, yes, you can still respond very well to treatment. Caveats to this would be if you have advanced hip arthritis, that's very challenging. Normally, if you have advanced hip arthritis, we'll refer people for surgery directly. But for other joints, still can respond well to treatment. And again, keep in mind that expectations when you have more advanced arthritis is more about improving pain and function to get you back to doing high level activity while improving how the x-ray MRI looks is less likely. So this is a nice case of someone that had uh, a significant ligament injury of the ACL. So can we improve tendon and ligament tears if they've occurred with these treatments? If you have a partial tear, definitely. If you have a full thickness tear, in some cases, yes. So this is an example of a young man, 20 year old man, he's a butcher re playing recreational volleyball, injured his knee. I saw him a couple of months later at which time we treated his knee. The picture on the right, that's the kneecap, that's the thigh bone, that's the shin bone. This is a needle coming into the knee. This is an X-ray, X-ray guidance, high level X-ray guidance. What you see lighting up is the ligament, the ACL. You can only do this kind of injection under X-ray guidance. And um, the way that we know we're injecting into the ACL is because we see it lighting up here. So we, we treated him and three months later, he's doing great from an outcome standpoint in terms of pain and function and getting back to activity. He also had a great imaging result as well. So this is really exciting because traditionally you could not do this under, you know, without surgery. but with high level x-ray and ultrasound guidance, you can do this now. So his pre-treatment MRI is on the left. So 
what I've lit up is his ACL prior to treatment. Very hard to see, very disorganized looking. The picture on the right, on the other hand, is his MRI three months after treatment with his own cells. Here you now see ha you have a ligament that's very well structured, you can very clearly see, very well outlined. That's a great result in someone who has had not only a great clinical result in terms of pain and function, but also has a great functional result as well. This is a nice example of someone at a rotator cuff tear. It's a 57 year old man, he's a contractor. He does a lot of activity overhead. So has a lot of pain in his shoulder. The ultrasound image on the left, this gap that I'm imaging right here, that black area on, on those two pictures on the left, that's a full thickness rotator cuff tear, right? And that is less than two centimeters where it's a full thickness tear. This is three months later under ultrasound. You can now see that that tear has been filled in. There's no longer that black hole or black tear. There's now tissue and cells that are repaired there. So he's had not only a wonderful clinical outcome, he's had a great imaging outcome as well. So the next component to this is how do you do these treatments? You have to use high level image guidance to treat these conditions. And the reason why is because the tissues that we're trying to treat are very much very small little areas. And so here's a couple of examples of that. You know, th these are some shoulder examples. And, you know, what we're trying to do here is inject at a sub millimeter level. So as an example, on the left, this is the needle, this is injecting into the rotator cuff. I'm trying to hit a less than one centimeter area. On the right, this is injecting into the shoulder joint. We know we're in the right area because here's a little bit of contrast in the joint. We're also injecting into a labrum. And how do we know that? Because here's a little contrast into a labrum. The only way you can do that is with high level image guidance. And again, these are pictures Excuse me. These are these are shoulder pictures. The next ones are knee pictures. I showed these before. On the left, injecting into the patellar tendon. On the right, injecting into the ACL. And again, you can really only do this on a high level image guidance. I have colleagues that'll tell me that they do these kind of treatments blindly, meaning just by feeling the joint or feeling the area. That's uh, that that doesn't make sense. We're trying to inject tissue that can be three, six centimeters, um, several inches deep, and you can't target submillimeter level blindly like that. You have to use these kind of tissue. You have to use these kind of modalities. And as I told patients, until I have x-ray vision, I'm going to be utilizing the tools that we have on hand because that's how we make sure we're hitting the right areas. So this is another example of someone that is avascular necrosis. He had arthritis in the ankle as well as avascular necrosis. The picture on the left on MRI where I'm pointing out that's avascular necrosis. That's swelling and inflammation in the bone. And this is his example three months after stem cell treatment where now that avascular necrosis has resolved. He's had a great, he's had a great result from a imaging level, but he's also had a great result from a clinical level. He's a 40 some year old man. He's a chef. He's standing all day long just was not able to do his work at some point. Now, because of treatment, he's able to stand for a 12 hour shift and is doing great. Regenerative medicine treatments offer safe and effective solutions for your pain. Again, if you have any questions, please shoot them into the chat section. Common other questions that I get, is this too good to be true? So there's evidence that goes back for a while now. Philip Hernigue is a orthopedic surgeon in France who's been doing this treatment since, since the mid 1990s, sorry, for knees and shoulders. And he has data that goes back that far. In the Regenics Network, we have data that goes back to 2005. My own personal experience goes back to 2008. I have colleagues who are new to this field who recognize this is a rapidly developing field, but think that it's new. It's not new. There are right and wrong ways to do this. 
I had a patient recently who was asking about treatment for his right elbow and wanted to know where's the evidence of plate leverage plasma helps with elbow tendonitis. And I told him, well, you can go back to a study published in 2006. And he was surprised to know that there's been that much or that duration of evidence since that time. So there are right and wrong ways to do this. You need to have expectations that are grounded in reality, evidence-based medicine, and you can get this done correctly. Great question just put in, can regenerative medicine be used to treat arthritis in the lower spine? Absolutely. Lower back arthritis issues, lower back degenerative joint issues, degenerative disc issues are some of the most common things that we treat. Absolutely, that, that is something that we treat all the time with either your own platelets or even sometimes your own bone marrow drive stem cells. So absolutely, that is a very treatable issue. Whether you've had prior surgery or prior injections, that's so treatable. Another great question, does this help with RA and ankles and spondylitis? So, you know, most of my colleagues that do these kind of treatments are generally either pain management, physical physiatrists, orthopedic surgeons, and um, uh, very few rheumatologists. I, I'm probably one of the few rheumatologists in the world that actually treats um, inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis and ankles and spondylitis, and also utilizing regenerative medicine for, orth for osteoarthritis and tendonitis. What I tell my patients that have got chronic RA or ankylosing spondylitis is if you have really widespread active inflammation, we need to find ways to control that first. Whether that is with medication, diet, supplements, you need to bring that total inflammation down. And then if you still have some chronic joint or tendon issues, then utilizing your own bone marrow and platelets makes a lot of sense. But if you have an overall systemic kind of body issue, that is, that, that is your bigger issue that needs to be treated first. And then you kind of stage it to then utilizing the germ medicine after that as well. To me, that's the right way to do this because that'll give you a better chance for a good result. So how long do results last? Again, Regenix has data that goes out to 10 plus years. Philip Hernigue has data that goes out to 15 to 20 years. I still tell people, if you have a chronic condition, expect that repeat treatment at some time down the line will be better. So what we know about treatment is that <clears throat> initial treatment will get you up to a higher level. If your baseline is down here, it'll get you to a higher level for some time. You may regress over time with additional injuries or instability, but you'll stay at a higher level. Repeat treatment will then put you to a higher level than that. There's a stair step effect where you go from baseline to one level to higher level. We know that. So expect that sometime down the line, you may benefit from another treatment. If you have a lot of chronic instability, expect that re re repeat treatments will do you even better. The best way to maintain results after treatment, improve your biomechanics, work with someone who can help you out in that regard, do all the right strengthening exercises, work on posture related issues, take the appropriate supplements that help for inflammation, and understand that repeat treatment can be additive to initial treatment. Cost. So common question as well, not routinely covered by insurance. There are, there are actually a few hundred insurance plans or companies rather that are now currently covering the United States in large part thanks to Regenix progressively going to self-insured companies and walking through companies to add this to their benefits plan. If you want to learn more about that, go to regenixcorporate.com. There are some workers' compensation companies that cover. There's, uh, there's TRICARE, which is the insurance for active duty military personnel that covers as well. But the vast majority of other commercial insurances and Medicare do not cover at this time. So nationwide, what you can expect in terms of cost, this is kind of averages. Cost estimates start in the US for PRP treatment, platelet treatments that are around 1500 per treatment and for stem cell treatment, 7,500 per treatment. What I would recommend as keys to determine value are number one, is your physician and clinical general medicine expert based on what I mentioned before? Are they focused on this? Do they have the right training? Are they talking the talk and you know, are they walking the walk as well? Are they doing this and focus on this all the time? Are you receiving a real stem cell treatment or are you receiving an amniotic or umbilical cord treatment that's been mislabeled? Another version of that nowadays that you hear about is exosomes. 
there's almost no data on the effectiveness of that. You have a lot of data for over 10, 15 years now for bone marrow stem cells and platelet-rich plasma treatments. Stick with the things that are proven. These are in-office procedures. If your physicians are taking you to a hospital or a surgery center, understand that you can get dinged with more facility fees as well. You won't get those if you're in an office procedure setting. It's a little bit about my own personal approach here at Chicago Arthritis and Regenerative Medicine. We're focused on non-surgical treatments for your arthritis, tendonitis, injuries, and back pain. We start evaluation by looking at, do you have inflammation? Do you have instability? Do you have asymmetry? Do you have any neuromuscular issues that we can treat? Try to correct those with low-risk interventions, exercise supplements. That's not working. Then escalate through regenerative medicine treatments, utilizing the best possible options for you in a way that is personalized to your condition, not a cookie cutter, one size fits all approach, a plan that feeds, that, that really suits your needs specifically and delivering cells at the highest level of image guidance, meaning x-ray and ultrasound guidance. How do you get evaluated? Again, you can just email us. You can go to the website, chicagoarthritis.com. actually just being typed in right now is the website address you can go to to schedule an appointment or to uh, uh, contact us for any questions. We are available for not only evaluation, but also to answer any questions. And if you have any other questions, I'll, I'll keep the chat open and uh, I can answer anything else at this time. But I think the way to really think about these treatments is if you have a musculoskeletal condition, most of us, the way that we approach our musculoskeletal health when it comes to our joints and our tendons and our backs is we sort of grin and bear it. We try to just get through it and we alter our activity over time, we end up just sort of giving up on activity and eventually we end up having to pursue surgery or bad options, you know, lesser options. We don't approve, we don't really approach our health for anything else in that same matter. Meaning if you have diabetes or high blood pressure, we don't sit there and say, why don't I wait for my first heart attack? I would recommend if you're having pain and it's not getting better quickly, get checked out for regenerative medicine treatment because you may have something that can get better with a fairly simple treatment. Great question. Does Medicare cover the initial evaluation? Absolutely. Pretty much all insurances do. Medicare, commercial insurance um, uh, will cover initial evaluation. They'll cover follow-up um, uh, evaluations. They'll cover any imaging that's required before treatment. They'll cover any physical therapy that's needed after treatment as well, any bracing that's needed. So it covers all that. It just doesn't cover procedures at this time. If I hadn't mentioned that before, I hope that's clear now. Wonderful. Well, if there's no other questions, I'll keep the chat open. Oh, there we go. Um, somebody asking. Yeah, that's, that's a great point, right? Um, <clears throat> somebody asking about their um, weight getting higher because they're not able to be as uh, physically active. So weight does not actually make a difference when it comes to treatment. Without a doubt, so as an example, we look at knee outcomes. If you have knee arthritis, we know that losing weight helps with knee pain. What's interesting is that when we look at, when it comes to utilizing your own platelets or bone marrow stem cells, does weight make a difference in terms of outcomes? It does not interestingly. And I think part of that is because if you are heavier, if you have pain relief and you're then able to get more physically active and exercise, then weight starts coming down again as well. But your body from like a pain standpoint, from an instability standpoint, from an inflammation standpoint, it still responds regardless of what your weight is. But I think a great thing is that if you're in, you know, there's a cycle of pain where if you have pain, you suddenly cannot exercise, you gain weight, your muscles get weaker, which then leads to more pain, and you get into this bad cycle. 
And we need to stop that cycle. We need to get it swinging the other way. So part of that is you get treated and then the cycle kind of slows down or stops. And then as pain gets better, you have better function and you're able to start doing more exercise and activity, then the cycle starts going the other way where now you have less pain, better function, better exercise, more strength, better, closer to ideal body weight. And then you start swinging into that other direction. And the treatments, the regenerative medicine treatments help optimize the joint and help keep you in that positive kind of cycle. And so um, weight does not make a difference in terms of outcome from treatment, but it does give you an opportunity treatment to actually optimize your weight because you'll have less pain. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. If, if you know, exercise is a form of treatment for musculoskeletal pain. Absolutely. Meaning as you can strengthen tissue, as you can improve stability, you can actually get better longer term as well. That, that's, that's a great point. So I, I think what's nice about these treatments is if you go into it with the mentality that these treatments are meant to augment what you can do on your own in terms of exercise, diet, supplements, lifestyle, all that, that this can help to augment all of that as well, then I think as a tool utilized in improving your life and your, your overall recovery from either pain or injury, then these treatments work very well. So absolutely do everything else you can on your own and utilize these treatments to help augment that for sure. Great. Well, I don't think there's any other questions. So I appreciate everybody's time. Uh, this is the Thanksgiving week. And so I appreciate everybody. I'm very grateful for your time and consideration to come out to learn more about regenerative medicine treatments for arthritis, tendinitis, injuries, and back pain. And if we can be of any additional assistance, whether that's answering questions or evaluating you or treating you, please let us know we're available anytime. And until we connect again in the future, I hope you have a good day and live well. Bye-bye.